Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the Weekly Top 3, our weekly podcast covering the top three things on our mind as we look ahead to the week of March 26th, 2018. This week and for the foreseeable future, we will be doing the Weekly Top 3 as a segment on The Michael Duke Show. The Michael Duke Show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 9 to 11 a.m. Instead of doing this as a monologue, I will be joining Michael on the show each Tuesday morning from 9.15 to 10 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about the three issues. We will continue to post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find the past episodes of the weekly top three at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us on these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. The House PFD vote taken on Monday of this week, the Alaska Senate's so-called spending cap, a bill that is currently before Senate finance, and what's driving oil prices, which were $70 as we did the show. And now, let's join Michael. Well, the ding it means... Somebody's got to join us, and that would be my friend Brad Keithley uh, from Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. Brad Keithley joins us every week to discuss oil, gas, and the economic forecast of Alaska. It's the Michael Dukes Show. Good morning, Brad. How are you? How about that? Now, now I can hear you. How you doing? All right. I'm doing great, Michael. How are you? Good, good. Just going through the daily fake news. You know how it is around here. Trying to keep people in line. Um, well, I was I was listening to you. Oh, okay. All right. Well, good. Um, so, so let's 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 take a crack at this today, since we're here and ready to go. Let's take a crack at this idea of uh, doubling our dividend uh, and you know just shattering the they're shattering the majority of the house. And I mean, God love Nat Hers, but um, I don't think you're reading between the lines on this, Nat, quite as well as you think you are. Well, um, he's he's reporting the news of the moment, and and the news of the moment is we're maintaining the statutory dividend. We're not we're not doubling the dividend. We're maintaining the statutory dividend. That's the that's the Alice in Wonderland world that we've gotten to. That uh, that having it is somehow normal, and if you if you restore it back to what the statute provides, you're doubling it somehow. Right, right. Well, and that's that's the real problem here is that I don't think that there's enough people who are digging into the actualities of what's going on here. He's not seeing the full picture. And, I mean, I don't know about you. Maybe it's just my cynical nature. But the first thing I saw on this whole deal was that it looked like it was another bout or batch of political theater. Well, it certainly certainly is in part that. Um, But what I think this – I view this as as a, a a role player as part of a much larger um, uh, setup. I think this is the House, at least some in the House, saying, "Look, we're not satisfied with the Senate's proposal to just rely on PFD cuts or to rely entirely on PFD cuts uh, to to fund government, uh, and and we need to have some counterbalance to what the to what the Senate's been doing." Uh, the House tried that last year, if you'll recall, uh, with passing an income tax and and a portion of the PFD cut, and then sort of at the end when the Senate wouldn't budge, uh, stuffing all the PFD back into the capital budget of all places, um, and and trying to trying to position themselves that way. That didn't work very well uh, for the House. So at least to some in the House, I think that uh, this bill uh, and this vote is trying to position the House to come into the conference uh, committee in a way that uh, – that makes the point that that they want a significant part of the PFD preserved. We we certainly haven't seen the end game play out here. Uh, this is political theater uh, to some degree, and as you were noting in the run up, um, uh, it it is you know try some some candidates trying to position themselves better in their races uh, than where they were. Uh, but I think I think as part of a larger picture, this is the House saying uh, to the Senate, uh, 
we're not going to fund this entirely on the backs of a uh, of PFD cut. So what do you think is likely the attitude of the Senate when this actually reaches out and hits their side of the world? Well, there's two things. There's two things that that, that uh, I, I think the Senate is going to be doing. One is uh, today uh, there there will likely be, maybe, but will likely be a motion for reconsideration of yesterday's vote. Uh, it was a tight vote yesterday, 21-19. Uh, if anyone flips their vote, uh, it, it goes the other direction. Um, and I would suspect there was some, there has been some pressure since the vote yesterday to try to find somebody on the House side to flip their vote uh, and uh, 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 turn the thing around so that the Senate, again, has a dominant position. The second, when it gets to the Senate, the Senate has said, uh, you know, it's, a sort, it's sort of the Senate mimic of the House, the picture of the House uh, majority last year where they had all their arms crossed and, you know, scowling faces and right. like, you right. know, no. I, the Senate has said, no, no, we're not going to do anything other than cut the PFD, and we're going to cut the PFD down to 1,000 or 1,100 or whatever whatever number the Senate's banding about right now. So the Senate's going to try to just, you know, just say no, the old uh, – Nancy Reagan approach of just say no and and see if they can you know hold their breath or hold out long enough to to force the house uh, force the house into submission. I, it's it's going to be a very interest if, if this vote's maintained if they get through reconsideration today um, and the votes maintained it's going to be a very very interesting conference committee. The the bill will go over to the Senate side. I guess the House also has to decide how they're going to fund all this. But the bill goes over to the Senate side. Uh, the Senate will amend it uh, probably fairly quickly, send it back uh, by striking the PFD down to the sentence level. Uh, the House will then be put to the test of whether to accede to the Senate's vote. House will likely reject the Senate because the Senate will do a bunch of other things the House doesn't like either. Um, and uh, it'll go to conference, and then we'll be in conference for uh, for probably a prolonged period of time. Right. Um, let's talk a, a couple about a couple of things that I noticed here uh, in this article that I just want to touch base with you on, because I think it part of the thing is, is Alaskans, of course, are consuming their information. There's a handful of Alaskans who are listening to a show like this, but a lot of people are consuming their news through the Anchorage Daily News and others. And I'm looking at how this is being reported on, and this is why I've been kind of chastising Nat Hers. Uh, for some of his reporting on this, uh, through some of the phrasing, let me just try, let me just hit you with a couple of phrases and 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 passages here, and get your thoughts on what's really happening here. Um, the, he talks in the first part of the article about Monday's proposal spending an additional nine hundred million dollars from the earnings reserve, and then here's the quote: even though House leaders had already to propose to withdraw what they described as the maximum sustainable amount from the fund this year. And, and this is what they talk about. They, they, he's taking the he's taking the, the the houses and the governor's word and the senate's word, quite honestly, on a lot of these things, and saying these aren't sustainable anymore. We can't draw up. To, I mean, there's we could draw fifty percent of the fund out of there. There's sixteen billion dollars in the earnings reserve, but this is the maximum sustainable. Like if we took it out now, it's going to crash. Later on, he goes on to talk about how the governor was quoted as saying that uh, Walker's office distributed a document to lawmakers that say paying the full $2,700 amount would reduce the fund's real value by 14% over the next decade if the House also uses permanent fund earnings to fill the deficit the way that it's proposing. And so we keep getting this narrative that it, it, to fix it, we've got to break it to fix it. And, and, that's, and, and that seems to be a common thread here. Yeah, this started two years ago. When uh, when the the legislative finance division started treating um, uh, the the dividend the dividend funds as part of government revenue uh, and thus uh, the the payment of the dividends as part of government spending up before that before two years ago uh, they were always treated as the dividends were always treated as something separate uh, designated general funds or other funds. They were always treated as below the line. It was just a given um, uh, amount that went for the permanent fund dividend according to statute, uh, and it never came into the calculation of, of government funds. Two years ago, legislative finance redid, and I'm sure at the direction of leadership, uh, uh, came in, redid the way that they presented these numbers, and all of a sudden, 
uh, the permanent fund dividends, the permanent fund revenues that were being withdrawn for dividends came in as government revenues. Uh, and then the, the dividends started showing up uh, as government spending. That's not what Hammond envisioned. That's not the way the statute sets up. Uh, the way the statute sets up, government essentially uh, is supposed to be a fiduciary. They're, they handle the money that's supposed to go to Alaska citizens, but all they do is handle the money. They're like a bank or like a like an escrow agent or, or, or some other type of fiduciary. They're just supposed to do the mechanical, mechanical steps of taking the money from the, from the permanent fund corporation who's supposed to give the money right. to the permanent fund division, take that money and then, and then hand it out. What's, what's happened now in the last two years is it's like a bank or an escrow agent saying, hey, that's my money, <laughs> and I'll give it to you if I want to. Um, and, and, and it's really changed the dynamics and, and changed the language uh, of how this thing is, is, is talked about. It shouldn't have happened. The statute says... 50% goes from the permanent fund corporation to the permanent fund division. Yes, the it goes through the hands of the legislature technically on its way there, but it goes. the statute says goes from the permanent fund corporation to the permanent fund division, and then the permanent fund division statute says you pay it out uh, in accordance with, uh, with the statute, in, in, in accordance with how you calculate dividends uh, under the statute. It's not supposed to come into government. So this is all – it's all a, a, a study in if you change the language, can you, can you change the thought process? Um, and you know, the ADNs bought in on it, the Alaska Journal of Commerce, most of the media uh, has bought in on it. And frankly, I think without a lot of thought about what they were doing. One thing he did hit on well that I think that you've touched on in the past is that said that supporters of Monday's budget amendment to boost the PFDs point to research that shows the check lifts as many as 25,000 Alaskans out of poverty each year. I find it ironic that the supporters of this idea and this amendment point to that part of the research, but they never pointed to the part of the research that said that had the single largest impact on the economy would be a touching of the permanent fund. They apparently missed that part of the research ahead of time. Yeah, this is this is this is sort of a running discussion I have with Nat and others uh, in the press about about how they report this. I mean, let, let's be very very clear. The only detailed economic analysis uh, that's been that's that's gone on on this on this issue uh, in the last two years, and and indeed it built on similar economic analyses that have gone on in years before. The only economic analysis out there. Uh, says that cutting the PFD has the largest adverse effect on the overall economy is, quote, by far the costliest to Alaska families and takes the most money out of the, uh, out of the Alaska economy of any uh, of the fiscal options. Those are serious issues, serious consequences of, of going down this road. And yet you can't find that. You find it rarely reported uh, in the media. Um, yes, the, the poverty level does also increase. That is a significant consequence. It's frankly a, uh, the, same, the same reasoning that goes into the calculation that says it's, got, it's the costliest uh, for Alaska families. Uh, but you can't, you can't find that in there. Again, the media has just bought into the narrative that leadership and the government, uh, the governor, have, uh, have given them. Let's uh, let's move on from uh, Nat Herz's article on that, and let's talk a little bit about the uh, the Senate and again more political theater this time in the form of their spending cap. We're going to do the right thing. We're going to cap ourselves. We are going to do it. We're doing it for you, and uh, and they've now passed a spending cap which I think you and I have discussed that basically it's not even worth the paper that it's printed on because they get to decide what laws they follow and what laws they don't, right? Yeah, it's, it's, that, that's a serious joke. This, this claim of a spending cap is a serious joke, and it's, serious, it's a serious joke for, for all sorts of reasons. One, it's not enforceable. Under the Supreme Court's permanent fund uh, 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 dividend decision, uh, the, the the legislature and the governor don't have to follow fiscal statutes in any given year through the appropriations process or through the veto process. They can override any statute uh, they want to, and and they have. They've, they've, the, the permanent fund dividend statute is still on the books. Uh, they've ignored it. Uh, so it, this is the same 
It's the same type of fiscal statute that the Supreme Court said the legislature can ignore. So it's an it's an unenforceable. Uh, uh, at best, it's a guideline uh, that 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 the legislature could, in any given year, just uh, just ignore. But more than that, Michael, even if you assume that this statute somehow was enforceable, it is bullet ridden. Uh, it doesn't apply. It only applies to the operating budget. It doesn't apply to the capital budget. If you go back and look at what's happened to the state since roughly 2010, when we went on this spending binge, the largest part of the of the of the overspend came through capital spending, and this and this cap uh, doesn't even uh, doesn't even purport to 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 to, to govern cap to govern capital spending. Right. The other thing. Is you can call. I mean, the legislature can call any. It's up to them whether they call an expenditure an operating budget expenditure or a capital budget expenditure. <laughs> as I was talking, as as we were talking earlier, last year the house the house when they were trying to jam the Senate and 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 get create some leverage to deal with the Senate's proposal to only cut the PFD, uh, the House put the PFD into the capital budget and and passed the capital budget. Uh, back over to the Senate. You, there, there are numerous examples uh, through the last ten years, just the last ten years, where one body or the other or both bodies uh, end up calling an operating budget item a capital budget item. So, so they can they, even if the statute were enforceable, which it's not, uh, they can end run it by just recategorizing uh, what are whatever it is they want to spend. And then there are <laughs> there are numerous exceptions. To this, to this so-called spending cap, uh, that uh, uh, you can drive Mac, uh, drive, drive a Mack truck through. For example, uh, the oil and gas tax credits, uh, which is uh, has been treated, the repayment of those oil and gas tax credits has been treated as an operating budget item, but that category of expenditure is excluded from the calculation of the cap. So it it is it is political theater at its grandest. It's an unenforceable, bullet ridden, um, uh, only halfway applicable uh, 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 purported cap. Uh, it, it's it, it its only purpose is to give uh, the Senate some basis for claiming that they're being fiscally responsible uh, in the actions they're taking. It doesn't solve a thing. Again, political theater. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. Uh, they're going through the motions and machinations uh, to me. And again, maybe it's just the cynic in me talking. But when you look at what's going on with uh, with the upcoming elections, they know where they're going and they want to have some talking points when they hit that election trail. They want to have some talking points so they can say, we did this. We voted to double your PFD. We voted to put on a spending cap in the government. I voted to do this. Send me back and I'll do more. That's that's what I see in everything that's happening right now. It, it is. And, and, and this is, I mean, this is symptomatic of government as a whole. We see the same thing going on in Congress. Right? Oh, yeah, in, absolutely. In 2011, in, in 2011, we almost had a breakdown where the where the well, in fact, we went a few days where the government didn't pay uh, its debt. Uh, the you, you'll, you'll recall that there was a a bill. Uh, the Obama administration proposed a bill, had to propose a bill to increase the debt ceiling so the government uh, could pay its debt, had authorization to pay its debt. The Republican Congress uh, opposed it, uh, uh, in large part, brought government almost to its knees in terms of being able to pay its debt. As part of the resolution of that issue, they passed what they called uh, the Budget Control Act, the Budget uh, the Budget Control Amendment, uh, no, the Budget Control Act of of 2011, um, and and that set uh, a ceiling uh, on government spending, and it it said that if you exceed that ceiling, uh, that you then had to, if you pass laws that exceeded that that would exceed that ceiling, you then had to bring government spending, other government spending down on a on a proportionate basis right divided in into military and non-military bring it down on a proportionate basis in order to offset that increase so that you didn't increase spending over a cap well in 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 three or four instances since even before this year when it when when that ceiling was about to apply the 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 legislature uh, or the, the congress just passed waivers 
um, and 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 waived the applicability of those of those caps uh, and allowed uh, 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 the budget or allowed spending to increase. This Congress did exactly the same thing when they passed the Tax Act uh, and when they passed the 300 billion uh, plus spending bill uh, in uh, in February. They just suspended the applicability of those budget caps. So, you know, you can talk a good game uh, about budget caps. Oh, you know, we've, we've, we've capped spending and, and, and that will constrain us. Uh, but it just doesn't happen if you don't go in and do the fundamental things necessary to change spending. In Congress, it's, you know, dealing with uh, uh, the, the entitlement programs of Medicare, uh, Medicaid, uh, Social Security. If you don't go in and change those fundamental things, nothing changes. You just they just end up suspending the cap. Same thing in Alaska. If you don't go in and change the BSA, if you don't go in and change the K through 12 BSA, if you don't go in and change uh, state Medicaid, if you don't go in and change the university, um, and if you don't think about how to address PERS and TERS, you're not going to you're not going to effectively control spending. You may say you have a cap, but when push comes to shove, just like Congress, uh, it'll get waived. Right. And the BSA, for those of you who are paying attention at home, is the base student allocation, which is the funding formula, which is one of the things that we've talked about in the past that need to be addressed. Because, I mean, they've locked these things like the student, the K through 12 BSA. Uh, They've locked them in. And basically, it's like a set it and forget it. It's got automatic escalators in it. The price goes up every year. The cost, you know, the, the spending goes up every year. Nobody even checks in on it. I mean, it's like they just, it's like yeast. They threw it a bowl with a little flour, water, and sugar and just walked away from. It just grows and grows and grows and grows and grows. The last time the BSA was analyzed was in 2008. Uh, Mike Hawker, uh, who was then a representative, uh, led a a uh, committee or an effort to review the BSA and make adjustments to it. And they, they frankly changed education policy. They went in, they examined uh, how the BSA was working. They looked at what it incentivized, uh, what it disincentivized, made some changes and, uh, and adopted uh, a, 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 a reformation of it uh, that's, that's gone on from 2008 since. We know that our school system isn't producing uh, the results we want, that we're not having graduates or we're not getting uh, uh, students, uh, student achievement at the level we want. Part of that is that we're incentivizing and disincentivizing things through the BSA, uh, through how we, you know, how do we pay for things um, uh, that are that are leading to uh, the, con- the, the results we're giving. So we need to go in, we need to go in and look at the BSA just like was done in 2008 and analyze whether, you know, whether we're incentivizing and disincentivizing the right thing. Set aside for a moment the cost. Just are we doing the right things with, what we're, with how we've set up the BSA? And then once you sort of go through that analysis, layer in the cost on top of that, can we afford to continue the way, the way we're going? You know, the same thing with the university. Um, uh, the university, the last time I did the analysis about a year and a half ago, the university is spent, the state is spending roughly $20,000 per student uh, in the University of Alaska system uh, uh, in state spending. If you look at, their, at the peer group, uh, the peer group that the university themselves identify as peer systems to the University of Alaska system, it's Maine, uh, Montana, and then the Southern Illinois University system. The, uh, those three spend $5,000, $7,500, $10,000 in state funding per student. Those are the peer group, the peer institutions that the university system itself has identified. Half and less than half than what the University of Alaska system is spending. Right. We've got more than enough money to have a great university system. We're just dividing it among too many institutions, and we're trying to do too many things in too many places. We, we need to go in. We need to analyze that and, and get a better result. It's not... We're not. Necess- it's not. It's not all about the cost. It's getting a better result, you know, a more efficient result, a be- better bang for the dollars uh, that you're spending. We're not doing those things. I mean, that's what needs to be done. That's what needs to be done at the congressional level. We need to go in and we need to look at Medicaid, Medicare. We need to look, frankly, at military spending. We need to look at at how we're spending this money, um, uh, and and that's what we need to do instead of these artificial budget budget caps. We need to do that at the state level uh, as well. There are things that we need to analyze 
that that the Senate uh, is is pushing off, trying to avoid by coming up with the, as you correctly put it, the political theater uh, of spending caps. Well, and this has been part of our problem for years, Brad, is that nobody is got you know nobody's got the political moxie uh, or the chutzpah to, to put it together. I mean, there's a handful in there that want to do the right thing, but they are in the vast, vast minority uh, on both sides of the uh, both chambers of the of the legislature, and we're we're dealing with people who, in some cases, have been there decades that are very happy with the system that they have now and would like it to continue. I mean, that that really is the only thing that I can infer from the actions that we've seen over the last couple of years. Yeah, there's 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 really three big forces going on. One is, is those who like uh, government as it is, government programs as they are, and those aren't just Democrats. I mean, it's 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 Republicans who 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 like uh, you know big spending? The Ron Duncan's GCI who likes the big spending on broadband uh, to reach all of these rural schools that we've got. So they oppose uh, the consolidation of the rural school system because my God, we wouldn't need you know we wouldn't need broadband all these locations. We wouldn't we right. wouldn't get subsidies for the build out of our broadband system. So it's I mean we've we've got we've got in, entrenched interests that that like uh, the system uh, as it is. Uh, and then you've got uh, uh, the top 20 percent who basically some many of whom like like uh, the, the system as it is, like government spending as it is, because they benefit from it. But they don't want to pay for it. Um, so they don't want to. My gosh, you know, we don't want to have any sort of tax uh, to uh, uh, that would that would impose costs on us. We like this system where, you know, we shove the costs off in the middle and lower incomes through PFD cuts. Uh, a PFD cut has. A less than two percent effect on a family of four in the in the in the top twenty percent. It has a thirty percent effect on the income of a of a family of four in the bottom twenty percent. So the top twenty percent is saying, "Yeah, wow, this is you know, let's keep government programs where they are. We don't have to. We just have to give up a little bit of our PFD. Uh, we shove the bulk of the costs off on middle and lower incomes. And so you know, you have you have that faction in there." And then you have the faction. The, the third big factor is the, is the faction that that you know they want to do whatever is politically expedient. They want to get through the next election. Uh, if that means uh, you know satisfying the teachers by keeping K through 12 going, then that's fine. If that means you know not not addressing uh, Medicaid, then that's fine. I mean, so you've got these three forces that keep you know keep the system up where it is. I'm not sure we ever break through that unless we have a governor uh, that comes through with a veto pen and is and is going to say we need to we need to bring this down. And unless we have a legislature uh, who says, you know, if we're not going to bring spending down, then we need to we need to pay for it in a way that that uh, that is fair and equitable across all income classes, as opposed to shoving it just onto the backs of of middle and lower income Alaska families. Well, and let's, I guess, let's talk about that next step. And I, I do want to get into some of the broader global and, and national pictures and their effect on Alaska. But let's talk for just a second about um, the solution. I mean, you just pointed out what we have here is a failure of leadership, both at the administrative level, I think at the legislative level. And I think it, it basically calls for a sea change. I mean, I think that we've got an opportunity coming up in this election cycle to make some differences, um, but people are going to have to get out there and they're going to have to they're going to have to to sacrifice some stuff. They're going to have time, money, effort, energy. There, there's going to be things that are going to have to be done, or we're going to get what we've always got. Yep, exactly right. And and there's I mean, there's opportunities out there. There's candidates who are emerging. Mike Dunleavy certainly at the at the at the gubernatorial level. There's candidates who are emerging at the legislative level, both in the, you know, challenging uh, incumbents like Ron Gillum's run against uh, Peter Macecki down in the, down in the Kenai, uh, and 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 there's other candidates who are emerging at the at the legislative level who I think, you know, are are trying to, trying to do the right thing, trying to position themselves to be able to do the right thing, but they've got to be elected, uh, in order to uh, in in order to to make those changes. I, I think they're having an effect even even now. Uh, one effect that I noticed yesterday was Bryce Edgman, uh, who who has long said you've got to cut the PFD, um, voted to restore the PFD back to the statutory level. Part of the part of the factor in that is he's got an opponent uh, out in his district, William Weatherby, 
who's been talking, who's been harping on the the adverse consequences of cutting the PFD, uh, both statewide and in that district. So I think you're seeing uh, some of those candidates have an effect uh, even before the election. But they, but but if they don't, I mean, if if they aren't sustained, if we don't adequately fund them, if they don't, uh, if they aren't positioned to run those races, if they aren't positioned to win those races, then we'll lapse back after the election. Uh, Bryce being a good example will lapse back after the election and people say, well, I got reelected. And so I get to go back and do, uh, do what I want to do. It's we're at, a, we're at a very important time, uh, on, on how Alaska is going to go forward from a, from a fiscal standpoint. And we've got I think to, we're seeing, and we've got to get involved. I mean, really? Yep. I'm sorry. Yep. You, absolutely. I, I mean, I, go ahead. No, I, 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 I absolutely agree. I mean, I, I have uh, 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 given money to some candidates. I'll continue to give money to some candidates. I pr- probably will run uh, an independent expenditure program again, like I have the last couple of races, um, and uh, and 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 do uh, do what I can. And I'm and and hopefully others will step up and do what they can as well. It's a it's a very important time from the standpoint of being able to uh, turn Alaska turn Alaska around. If we're gonna if we're gonna get our fiscal situation under control. Uh, it's going to take a combination of people who are willing to go in to K through 12, go and do the hard work of going into these spending programs and make reforms that uh, that that make them produce better results and bring them under control. Go into the university system and say, look, we're spending enough money on the university system. We're spending more than enough money, double what's being spent uh, in our in our in our peer group. Uh, more than double what's being spent with with some of the schools in our peer group. We're spending enough money. We need to we need we, we need to reduce it. We need to figure out what makes a better system. And frankly, I think that's you know sort of going back to the single university system that the Constitution envisioned, building up UAF, uh, the University of Alaska Fairbanks, which is the flagship uh, institution, reducing the programs, um, uh, doing more distance learning at uh, at some of the other. Uh, institutions. There are ideas like that in all of the spending categories. Right. Uh, but we just, we should, people just, I mean, the Senate wants to go off and play games by uh, adopting bullet ridden and unenforceable spending caps and, and claim they're doing something when in fact they're not. You've got to do go in and do the hard work uh, in these spending programs. We're talking with Brad Keithley, who is uh, founder of Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. We're talking about the current uh, issues that are facing the legislature during this session. Uh, Brad, I had Mia Costello on the program last week, and she had some commentary, and I asked her specifically, uh, would she be willing to put this before a vote of the people? Uh, the issue of the PFD is what I was asking about. And she kind of uh, vacillated back and forth and eventually said no, because I think what she ended up really kind of saying was the people didn't understand, because if we put this into the Constitution, we could lose our tax-exempt status. and exec- exec- But people just didn't understand it, and they just vote with their pocketbook, which kind of mirrored what we heard uh, from Peter Machicki t- uh, two years ago during the session uh, when he came on the program to discuss it. Your thoughts? Well, it's. I mean, that, we don't trust the people that we're that we're supposed to be governing, that we're supposed to be governing in the name of, uh, to make decisions because because they're not smart enough to do it. That's you know we've gone over the edge when we have a uh, when we have uh, legislators uh, uh, claiming that. I, I have a I have a huge disappointment in Mia. I was one of the early supporters of Mia. She ran for the school board. She ran a great race. Uh, for the school board, and then she decided that she wanted to, to run for uh, a state house seat. I was a big supporter. I I maxed out in the contribution. She said all the right things. She wanted to get in there to work for Alaskans. She wanted to uh, to improve uh, the quality of life uh, for Alaskans. She wanted to be part of the. She was a young voice. Wanted to be part of the decision making process. Had all of the right. You know, we need to get spending under control at that time. Spending, you could clearly see. The spending was uh, was getting out of control. Said all the right things. Now that she's gotten in office um, and has, she's become part of the problem, not part of the solution. Uh, she uh, uh, she she has not been among the voices that has said we need to go in and look at the K through 12. We need to go in, look at the big spending programs, figure out you know how we can spend money more efficiently, uh, realign our objectives to 
both do it within cost and to better our, achieve our objective. She's not been uh, the voice of those. She's been more the voice of let's keep it going the way we are. And yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they don't want to go out to the public for, for on this issue because, because it will disrupt their concern. It will disrupt the way things are. Well, the way things are aren't working. We're spending more than we can afford. Uh, we are. We're. They're going off in the in the in the direction of of cutting the PFD, which has the quote largest adverse effect on the overall economy. Is by far the the costliest to Alaska uh, families and takes the most money out of Alaska of all the so-called new revenue options. I mean, they they, they are they are working. We've got to be blunt. They're working against the Alaska economy. Yep. Uh, cutting the PFD is working against the Alaska economy, working against the Alaska families. And they're doing it because they just want to keep on doing the same old thing. She's been captured by, in Mia's case, she's been captured by the special interests that, that want to keep going down the same road. Um, and, yeah, they're concerned about taking it out to the – to the to the Alaska constituency, to the Alaska voters, because because they readily appreciate that's not the direction Alaska voters want to go. Right. And they understand that. And I think that's the irony of this whole situation is they definitely understand where the Alaskan voters want to go, but they're trying to figure out how to have their cake and eat it too. How do we appease the voters while still keeping our special interests in our party, uh, you know, our party principles or whatever it is that they're doing, are how do we get everything at once? And the problem is you just can't. There's just not enough to go around, and we're going to have to make some hard decisions. And I think the hard decisions are going to have to be made for them by electing them by you know unelecting them because they just do not have the political will to make it happen at this point. Um, yeah, as we, as, as we discussed last time, if we want a different direction for the state, we need different people. We know where this group of people is going to take us. They're, they're going, to, going to continue to have uh, spending at unsustainable levels. They're going to continue to, to knee jerk, uh, to have a knee jerk reaction to cut the PFD that, ha- that has the largest adverse effect on the overall economy. Uh, the costliest to Alaska, by far the costliest to Alaska families, takes the most money out of the Alaska economy. They're going to continue to knee jerk to that. Uh, um, uh, we, we know where this group's going. So the the only way we're going to change government, the only way we're going to change that direction is to change the people that, have, that are taking us there. So other things are changing with us right now. Brad Keithley is our guest. We're talking about the Alaska and the budgets, oil and gas. And one of the big things that happened on the national stage is President Trump. Uh, in its infinite wisdom, decided to go ahead and change horses again in midstream. It's just, it's just this is too, this is too beautiful to watch. Uh, and now he's decided to switch out both the Secretary of State Rex Tillerson and his National Security uh, Director, uh, uh, and and he switched in with Mike Pompeo and of course John Bolton, both of whom are considered very hawkish. As a libertarian, Bolton makes me cringe. That guy, he never saw a war that he didn't want to get involved in, <laughs> and uh, and and they're both very hawkish, especially on Iran, and that's change some of the game when it comes to worldwide oil prices uh, trickle that down for us i mean tell us a little bit about the international and national stage and then trickle that down for us to alaska sure well it, it, it oil prices are driven by two things they're driven by by fundamental supply and demand do we have enough supply to 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 meet demand if not uh, oil price prices come up in order to incentivize additional money additional investment in the oil industry to produce more oil uh, to meet uh, to meet the higher demand it also works in reverse if we have lower demand we have too much oil prices go down that the fundamental supply demand piece of, of oil prices is is readily understood and frankly that's what's been driving the oil industry for the last oh three or four years probably. But there's another, there's another layer on top of supply and demand uh, that affects oil prices uh, sometimes and sometimes greatly, which is geopolitical risk. Uh, the, 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 the price fly up that started in 1973, for example, when the Saudis, uh, in response to the, to the uh, Israeli Arab War, one of the Israeli Arab Wars, the Saudis embargoed oil, uh, cut off supply, politically cut off supply. There was enough physical supply out there, but politically cut off supply. That started, you know, causing prices to uh, uh, to fly up. And and so every once in a while, you'll see geopolitical risk 
uh, uh, show up and 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 add to or subtract from uh, what's what the price that supply and demand otherwise arises at. What happens is people see this ge- geopolitical risk that that oil production in certain areas, key areas, is going to be curtailed for some reason, uh, cut off for some reason, and so the supply you think is going to be there isn't going to be there. Demand is going to is going to be maintained at a certain level, and so price will come up uh, in order to uh, in order for people to corral those barrels. They think they're going to need to uh, to meet demand. They start having there's increased competition for a lower number of barrels. That's what's going on. So so oil prices have now passed seventy dollars. They passed seventy dollars uh, last week. They're unlike the last time that they briefly passed seventy dollars. Uh, they're sort of sticking there. The price today, the price right now. That I have in front of me is still above, uh, still above seventy dollars. And what's going on uh, is we've got uh, with the with the change out administration with Pompeo replacing Tillerson, uh, with uh, uh, Bolton replacing McMaster. You've got a much more hawkish uh, uh, national security uh, advisory team or a national security team in place, uh, and that's starting to be priced into the oil market. Bolton has said some things about Iran in the past, about Iran policy. Bolton was one of those who was an advocate of the Bush-Iraq uh, invasion. You, you've seen you've seen Bolton in the past take 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 positions that have that have affected the availability of oil uh, from the Middle East, um, and and so the oil market is starting to price those things in and is starting to move uh, oil prices. That's a that's a good news bad news thing for Alaska, quite frankly. The bad news is we have a, a, a less stable world. Um, some say that it's it's appropriately less stable because America needs to be more hawkish on these things. Some say less, but but the but the but the but the reality is we have a less stable world uh, as a result of of those actions. Uh, that affects so that's a that's sort of a bad thing. Um, uh, but on the oil price side, it's a good thing for Alaska because oil prices move up. Um, our production tax starts clicking in with uh, uh, some more dollars for state revenue. That le- lessens lessens the pressure for these new revenue measures that uh, that you and I have talked about uh, uh, in in earlier today. Uh, and you start seeing you start seeing oil prices come up and uh, and and having uh, having that sort of impact. That also has other knock on effects. I mean, not only does it improve oil economics for Alaska. But for example, it, there was an article I read the other day that talks about, you know, the increasing prospect of of reigniting oil exploration and oil development in the Gulf Coast, the Gulf right. of Mexico. Right. Uh, that has been down. That 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 activity has been down because oil prices have been been down. So you start seeing, you know, potentially uh, investment in in new areas uh, as well. Uh, it's a it's a complicated dynamic, but generally speaking, increased oil prices is a good thing for Alaska, and we're beginning to see some of that. Brad Keithley is our guest uh, right here on the Michael Duke Show. We've been talking about the budget, the legislature, oil, gas, and politics. Um, final thoughts here, Brad, as we wrap things up. I mean, good, you know, like you said, higher oil price is good for state revenues, not necessarily good for consumers inside the state of Alaska. That has historically been the the inverse crux of that whole deal, is that every time the the state coffers start to get full, Alaskans are piling out more money just to stay warm and stay alive and to get back and forth to work and everything else. That's never really worked out. The inverse relationship there has never really worked out. And of course, when when the coffers start to run dry, and things go low and the prices go low, Alaskans may benefit a little bit, but they're, then, they, then of course, there's always the threat of taxes or taking the PFDs or other things. So it's, it's been a very tough time over the last 10 years for Alaskans in this regard. Uh, final thoughts as we wrap things up here this morning. Well, I think, I think you can't count on oil. I mean, those who, who those, <laughs> this will be the Senate again, those who would say oil prices are going up, we don't need to worry about you know, all of these other new revenue options anymore. I, that's wrong. I mean, oil prices are going up because of geopolitical risk. And the thing about geopolitical risk is it's very unstable. It may exist for a while, and then it may go away. Trump may have Bolton as an advisor for a year, six months. What, what was Scaramucci, a week? Right, uh, yeah. As, a, as, the, as the communications coordinator, he may have him as an advisor for a week and then fire yeah. him and then, you know, replace him with somebody else and geopolitical risk uh, uh, goes away. So you can't count 
on this spot, this particular aspect of the spike in prices, the portion that's attributable to geopolitical risk as being as being a long term persistent sort of thing, you need to count. You need to look at the fundamental supply demand characteristics and 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 sort of measure what those are doing to oil price uh, and, and and measure that as a long term thing. The second, I, I guess, the second thing is to go back to the first couple of segments. Is we've got to get um, uh, people in the legislature who are uh, who are looking long term, who are concerned about the overall Alaska economy, who are concerned about the impact of uh, of, of economics on families, who are concerned about keeping money in Alaska as opposed to bleeding it uh, out of state, and uh, and and that's not the crew we've got in there right now. So. We, we need to we need to focus on these fundamental drivers. We need to stop playing games with things like you know spending caps that don't work, that are just talking points and campaign ads as opposed to real things, and get people in there who will dig down and do the do the hard work that needs to be done. Brad Keithley, Alaska's for a sustainable budget. Brad, where do folks find you uh, out on the web in the world worldwide web area? The the best way to find us anymore is on Facebook. Our Facebook page, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Um, anything we write anyplace else or any comments we made anyplace else, we, we, we put links on that Facebook page, on our Facebook page feed. So frankly, if people want to follow and, and, and talk about and, and participate in this discussion, uh, going to our Facebook page, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, uh, is, the, is, the, is the place they'll find the most information. Brad Keithley, thank you so much, my friend, for joining us. I look forward to talking to you again next week. We'll see you right here on the program. Thanks for uh, thanks for being part of it today. Michael, as always, thank you for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages. and Keep track of us during the week on our Facebook and Twitter pages. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.